It's time to fight back against disinformation. But these are the people leading the charge. Can you please explain to us the difference between a bot and a troll? Is Twitter the same as what you do? You can look at a lot of gray hair and realize that uh, my technology capabilities are very shallow. Not very encouraging, is it? But this isn't the first time the U.S. government's been asleep at the wheel on this. Mr. Allen, how can we compete with this communist propaganda? You know now that Russia's been attacking the U.S. like this since the 50s, but did you know that for the first 30 years of that, no one in the U.S. government took it seriously? There was not a very high awareness of disinformation or active measures, so there was a, a tendency to want to keep the waters smooth. They use all the means of communication. The thinking went, if you respond to a fake story, you dignify it. I don't think we grasped it intellectually. Then, in 1980, a new cowboy rode into town. Ronald Reagan, his point of view was, we ought to be bold, we ought to tell the truth. Truth ought to be put front and center, and that if somebody were speaking the opposite, we ought to expose it. Get up! Presidents are very important. To the danger of espionage is added active measures designed to subvert and deceive, to disinform the public opinion upon which our democracies are built. Reagan created the Active Measures Working Group, you know, that government truth squad, which Kathleen Bailey led from 1985 to 87. I came at the problem believing that I could grab the tiger by the tail and whirl it over my head. I was going to win. They brought down the AIDS myth, Operation Infection, one of the greatest disinformation campaigns ever created. Proof that the best defense against disinformation is exposing it. Well, actually, it's not that simple. And I know the government administer AIDS. Decades later, surveys have found that millions of Americans still believe AIDS was cooked up by the US government. The lie lives on. In our music, on TV. My parents believe the government created HIV in a lab, and the CIA spread it in the prisons to kill blacks and gays. In comics, on YouTube, even in churches. Weaponized pathogens to hit selected groups of humans. Fighting disinformation, it's like a nightmarish game of whack-a-mole. No matter what you do, the lies just keep popping up. All of which makes us wonder, do we really stand a chance against disinformation? Or is this a virus that can never be cured? It ain't little green monkeys, it's little white honkies crossing both lines. Mark Twain once said, a lie is halfway around the world before the truth has even got its boots on. Except, even that's a lie. That quote's been attributed to loads of people. But whoever said it was right. We know now, empirically, that lies do have an unfair advantage over the truth, spreading further and faster, gaining traction every time they're repeated. Repetition is part of the game, and the more it's a bad story is repeated, 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 the more real it becomes to everyone. But Twain's around the world part is also true. This is a global problem. In Iran, the government's deploying their own version of the Soviet playbook, calling their operation Nafak, which is Farsi for discord. Myanmar's been brewing up endless conspiracy theories to justify ethnic cleansing. And in Pakistan, the establishment sees CIA plots everywhere. That last one even ensnared one of our own journalists here at the New York Times, an experience that was so upsetting to him it led him to make the film you're watching right now. Isn't that right, Adam? That's right. I was living in Pakistan. Al-Qaeda accused me of being part of a CIA anti-Islam plot. See, conspiracy theories are kind of like a national sport over there. And even today, I still get blasted on Twitter for being either a CIA spy or a dead terrorist. Wait, a dead terrorist? One of the country's most popular TV talk show hosts accused me of being one of the attackers in a school massacre that murdered dozens of children. Here I am, dead in the Pakistani press. But this stuff is kind of normal over there. I mean, it happens all the time. What I never imagined is that we'd be seeing this kind of toxic disinformation here at home in the States. So is there anything we can do? I think so. I also used to live in Eastern Europe. 
Estonia, Ukraine, they lag behind us in many things, but when it comes to fighting disinformation, there's so much we can learn from them. For instance, if uh, you turn on the TV in Latvia on a Sunday night, you'll see this. A primetime show all about Russian lies. In the same slot where we'd be watching American Idol, folks in Riga are tuning in to watch the latest disinformation be systematically described, debunked and destroyed. And it's not just Latvia. Ukraine has a bilingual stop fake news show broadcast by dozens of TV stations. Disinformation never stops and neither do we. Welcome to Stop Fake. The The Czech government monitors disinformation as a form of terrorism. Lithuania has thousands of volunteer cyber warriors. They call them elves who relentlessly troll the Russian trolls. And in Estonia, there's a kind of digital national guard. Thousands of volunteers who, among other things, fight disinformation. The countries that have been exposed to this the longest are the best at dealing with it. They see things we don't see, they smell things we don't smell. Meanwhile, back here, we're just learning the hard way what happens when we don't fight back. The Pizzagate conspiracy, no journalist was going to actively debunk that because they didn't think that anybody truly believed that. We now know that they did, and actually it, it, it seems that we should have done more coverage during the election, that there was a rumour circulating and, and, it, and let's debunk it. So this is the prescription, right? Fact-checking, media literacy, engaged citizens rallying around good journalism to create a culture of critical thinking. Ah, who are we kidding? Media literacy is great and all, but we need something way stronger. And for that, we've got to talk about the responsibility of this guy. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. They were designed primarily by uh, a group of quite young people mostly men, in, uh, on the west coast of the US, in Silicon Valley. I think there's a lot of people who went into the tech industry because they were very, very good at tech, not because they were good at civics or political science. And they really believed that they were building technology that would connect the world and would actually be a positive force in society. Well, naivety eventually morphed into flat-out denial. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth? The platforms have spent years shamefully ignoring information warfare. The ads and posts we are here today to discuss. The number of accounts we could link to Russia. Relatively limited. Comparatively small. We're a very small fraction of the overall content on Facebook. There's still a level of astonishing um, kind of political and cultural illiteracy where they think connecting people is good. So what exactly are they supposed to be doing? Well, there's no silver bullet, but there are a ton of ideas for things they could be doing, from improving transparency. About who's paying for posts. To fighting anonymity. Is there a real person behind this account? Is there a real person behind this platform? To helping us know whether we can trust what we're reading. Uh, A nutritional label on sources in your Google search findings. And getting serious about punishing violators. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. Now, companies like Facebook have recently been taking some baby steps along these lines. But don't get your hopes up. Social media platforms are dependent on the emotional, hyper-partisan stories that make great disinformation. The bottom line? Their business models are riddled with perverse incentives. If I'm Twitter and I have shareholders to keep happy and I have to go back to my shareholders and tell them how many active monthly users I have and the truth is that 22% of them are not human, I don't actually want to tell my shareholders that. I want to give them a lovely big number that means that we still have value and that we still make money. And that's the problem. Asking just isn't enough. We've got to force the platforms to change. And that means regulation. That's right. It's time for Uncle Sam to get in the game. The problem is, Uncle Sam knows how to mobilise when we get attacked like this. But when the warfare is digital... Well, you know. There are days when I wonder if the Facebook friends is a little misstated. That doesn't seem like I have those every single day. How many data categories do you store? Does Facebook store? Senator, can you clarify what you mean by data? Well, there's- These are the people who are supposed to be protecting you from information warfare. Do you store any? 
Senator, I'm not actually sure what that is referring to. Yeah. Uh, so I've testified five times to the Senate, either about terrorism or, or Russian active measures. There is a very uh, diverse level of understanding uh, of social media. Have people say, well, yeah, because my 13-year-old son, you should see how he uses it. Now, my son, Charlie, who's 13, is dedicated to Instagram, so... I feel very fortunate that I have not had to go to the House uh, to testify. I think it would be a giant waste of time. To disinform the public opinion upon which our democracies are built. History tells us that the fight against disinformation starts with strong leadership. And I've got to tell you, we've been let down on this for a long time. Now, I'm not talking about him just yet. I'm talking about him. Americans and Russians share common interests that form a basis for cooperation. It was really hard to get the Obama administration to take Russia seriously as an issue. We could have looked at sanctions earlier. We could have talked about measured cyber counterattacks or even diplomatic negotiations. But that didn't really happen. The Obama administration kind of got played into a box by recognizing it too late. Obama actually signed an executive order to counter foreign disinformation. But he was so obsessed with the threat from ISIS, its mandate only covered terror groups. State actors, like Russia, were free to carry on unimpeded. To his credit, Trump actually reversed this, and some people in his administration are talking tough. Uh, Russia is known for its disinformation campaigns. But the higher up you go, uh, let's just say the less enthusiasm there is. The point is, if it's their intention to interfere, they're going to find ways to do that. We can take steps we can take, uh, but this is something that once they decide they're going to do it, it's very difficult to preempt it. So what has been done? Well, Congress put aside $120 million to fund our defence against this information. The Trump administration sat on it silently for 18 months, and when they did release it, they gave just a third of it. Not much of a counter-strike, is it? I mean, where's the urgency here? These Russian attacks were first plotted way back in early 2014 and we're only now coming to grips with them. We are still playing catch up from a long way behind. We are looking in the rear view mirror, getting less bad at working out what Russia just did to us. We're still not looking through the windshield, to find out what's happening right now and what's going to be happening next. This is one of the great unsolved policy questions of our time. A functioning government would at least come together to publish full, detailed reports of all these attacks. But the problem isn't just our lacklustre government. It's actually much scarier than that. Because now the threat is coming from inside the White House. It's finally time to meet President Disinformation. Donald Trump is a one-man wrecking crew for the truth. And he knows all the moves. First, there's Trump, the denier. And when it comes to disinformation, he even denies we're being attacked. And if it is Russia, which is probably not, nobody knows who it is. Never mind what his own officials say. Manipulation, outright lies. Literally up their game to the point where it's having a significant impact. Then there's Trump, the useful idiot. This is a man who's never met a conspiracy theory he wouldn't tweet. Why doesn't he show his birth certificate? You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden! The same person votes many times. You probably heard about that. They always like to say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. Not a conspiracy theory, folks. We also know he shared stories originally planted by the Kremlin. I mean, not even the KGB could have dreamt up a useful idiot as prominent and powerful as Trump and his administration. And then there's Trump, the disinformation natural. He doesn't just regurgitate this stuff, he invents his own. It was the biggest electoral college win since Ronald Reagan. I said, wait a minute, there's a lot of wiretapping being talked about. We've signed more bills, and I'm talking about through the legislature, than any president. ICE, they actually liberate towns. They liberate towns. We have become an energy exporter for the first time ever just recently. It's weird, but this is somehow worse than the Cold War. Back then, it was just us versus them. But now, it's us versus them and us versus us.
Here's the thing about democracies. They can't function unless we all agree on a basic set of facts. We can't debate anything, healthcare, immigration, gun control, unless we're aligned left and right about what is actually true. Disinformation pollutes those waters, confusing us so we end up debating facts instead of discovering solutions. And as we spiral downwards together, our adversaries applaud from behind the curtain. And here's the kicker. The things that make democracy good, living in an open society with a free press and political diversity, those are the things, weirdly, that make us vulnerable. Any country with an authoritarian leader and limited freedom of speech, they're the ones with the advantage right now. Which kind of raises the question that maybe only history can answer. Can the good guys ever win? You absolutely never win. Never. This problem is going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. The next few years are going to be worse than the last few years. And they will continue using it, regardless of what we say here in the discussion, regardless of, of the outcome of the discussion uh, and investigation. But we will not always be losers in this game. There will be victories here and there. It's only when we quit the game quit trying to expose them, that we lose. As long as we can expose them, they're losing. It's like an exhausting, never-ending game of whack-a-mole, but we've got no choice but to play. We've got to fight disinformation as best we can, whenever and wherever it rears its ugly head. We're in this for the long haul, whether we like it or not. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration Period. In the mysterious murder of former DNC Period. staffer Seth Bridge. And there were the masterminds behind the Bowling Green massacre. Who apparently was assassinated at four in the morning. The president still strongly feels that there was a large amount of voter fraud. The 9-11 hijackers are alive and well. People who are behaving like actors. The murder rate in our country is the highest it's been in 47 years. You had the NATO base in Turkey being under attack by terrorists. Uh, this is the greatest overreach and the greatest abuse of power. This video that you link to appears to be a hoax. All we did was put out what he had on his internet.